Well, good morning if you are in San Francisco, California. Good afternoon if you are anywhere in the eastern part of North, Central, or South America. Good evening to people in Europe and Africa, and greetings and hello around the world to people wherever you are, especially our loved ones in Ukraine. It is Friday. I'm Fred Plotkin. That makes us Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Idajo, the place where classical music happens. As you certainly know by now, Idajo is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to music lovers all around the world. And those of you who have joined me for almost three years now on this program know that I asked people to join me who I see as very talented, who make great contributions to the arts, to cuisine, to politics, to ideas, and a fellow whose work I've known for a very, very, very long time is John Keane, who's currently chorus director of San Francisco Opera. Previously, he was head of music and chorus master at Seattle Opera. He was at Florida Grand Opera, which is in Miami. He was a founder of the Elysian Opera Group in New York. He has worked on all kinds of opera productions in the places where you want to work on opera productions, improving these productions, but not necessarily being seen by the public. And I think it's very important that I include those figures who are crucial to opera and to the arts, who are not necessarily the ones that we see on stage. So John joins me today from San Francisco. Hello, John. How are you? Hello, I'm great. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be here. My pleasure. Um, I'm going to go, I, I make it sound like you're ancient. You're not. I'm older than you are, and I'm not ancient. Uh, you must have begun very young. <laughs> yes, I think my first piano lesson, I was five. Or maybe legend. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, yes, I started very young, but at that point, of course, I had no idea that I would pursue it as a career or, um, you know. Broke uh, up a little, but. Sorry, I'm losing you. Okay, you so, are. John, your sound is broken up a bit. Um, what I wanted to ask you first is about a person named Gwendolyn Koldowski. Yes. Known as Gwen. Yeah. And I see that John is frozen in place. I don't know if I am frozen in place. I'm not sure. I hear you and I this see is you the perfectly well. Vagaries of Doom. Oh, there you are. Um, okay. Oh, good. Okay. I'm gonna have you talk then. Who was Gwendolyn Koldowski, who Marilyn Horn holds up as the exemplar of being the greatest collaborative pianist she ever worked with? Yes. Um, talk about collaborative piano, talk about Gwendolyn Koldowski, what she did at University of Southern California, and I'm interested to know how she taught. Ah, uh, Gwen was uh, everything that, that Marilyn Horn says and more. She was actually the first uh, person in the United States, and I think maybe actually the world, to create an academic degree in accompanying and collaborative piano. Before she did that, there was no formalized training. It was more a sense of pianists who had that special interest forging their own way of studying repertoire, et cetera. But she fashioned an academic degree, which I think really was the beginning of the opening up of that world of so many pianists who had that interest, having a way of receiving real training and experience uh, in their formative years. I, my story is that I was really training as a solo pianist and thinking that that was probably the path I was supposed to follow, but I knew instinctively that that was not my first love, and my first love was definitely chamber music, vocal music, accompanying, accompanying instrumentalists and singers both, and I just happened, uh, because I was studying with a very fine teacher, John Perry, who was uh, uh, hired at uh, University of Southern California, I was already studying with him. And I told him, that's wonderful, I'll go with you and I'll move to Los Angeles, which I did. And what I discovered when I arrived there was that Gwen was the sort of, uh, she was near the end of her teaching career. She's already 70, 
plus and she was ready to retire but I heard her play and I was in her song master classes and I realized this is exactly what I have been dreaming about and hoping for and so I told Mr. Perry that I was changing my degree plan and that I was going to study with Gwen uh, she very graciously, even though she had been told not to take any new students, she agreed to teach me. And coincidentally, there was a gentleman in the same song classes, and she asked me if I would mind accompanying him, and his name was Thomas Hampson. <laughs> and so I really had a wonderful start with her of on a weekly basis preparing song repertoire with Tom and performing in her classes. And then later I studied privately with her. She was um, one of the most amazingly beautiful pianists I've ever heard live. Uh, partly that's about a liquidity of her tone, which was a very high priority to her and very much something that she talked about constantly in her teaching. The need for a, a pianist, especially with singers, to create a non-percussive um, liquid sound that really supported and cushioned the, the singing voice. And that's something that we worked on every lesson that I can remember. She, um, the, the repertoire was in her bones. It, you could name an obscure Schubert song and she could sit down and play and, and knew exactly what poem and what song you were speaking of. She often talked about playing for Lottie Lehmann at the end of her career when she was, you know, needing to adjust things given what her voice was doing that day. And she had a repertoire with Lehmann where she said, you know, we would we would be backstage and she would turn to me and say, I think it's F sharp is good this evening. And Gwen would go out on the stage and play in whatever key she <laughs> mentioned. Um, the stress of that gives me a little bit of anxiety, even as I mention it. But that was the kind of musician she was. But also just as a person, she was one of the most um, empathetic personalities I've worked with especially as a teacher. I think so often that the, the teacher-student relationship is very much at a distance and has a great character of authority and, and, and subservience on the side of the student. And I felt from her such a respect and such an empathy. Um, for example, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, had a, I was assigned to play for a competition, a pretty high level competition in Los Angeles. And uh, one of the soloists I was assigned to was unhappy with my work and said, I'm really disappointed in you not supporting me more. And I went to Gwen in a, a kind of a panic, thinking I'm playing as well as I know to do, and I don't perceive these problems. And she, she stopped her day and spent, I don't know, an hour at least um, talking with me and reassuring me and, and letting me know that this was not an, an atypical thing to happen in this career and that I needed to sort of think of it in those terms. How could I learn from this and realize that not every soloist, even if you feel there's a great artistic collaboration or a great artistic respect, you may not click, you may not um, jive, and how do you handle that? So she taught more than just musical nuts and bolts or pianistic nuts and bolts. She was really a whole person and really had, um, uh, an interest in all of her students succeeding and finding their specific paths. So my New York Zoom connection is a little wobbly today, and I think uh, I got most of what you said. If okay. I ask you something that you've replied to, just say I already answered that. Okay. Um, the one thing, of course, Thomas Hampson was my very first guest on this program on April 24th that? of 2020. We're, we're pals. Um, the second thing is, do you think that the word accompany, accompanist is a word that really should be retired in a different term like collaborative pianist, collaborative musician, collaborative artist? Because I can remember even some of the great ones of the past, like Gerald Moore, seem very subservient to the singer he worked with, yes. when in fact... To me, he was an equal partner. Yes. Uh, I, I feel like accompanist and collaborative pianist to me is almost interchangeable. And I don't see the collaborative pianist as any improvement or indicates any better um, the relationship. I, I actually, in a program or in, in, in a listing or marketing, I prefer for something to say 
uh, Tom Hampson, baritone, John Keane, pianist. Um, that's what we are. I'm, I'm a pianist. A singer is a soprano or a mezzo-soprano. And it's obvious that we're collaborating if we're, if we're performing a song recital or any sort of concert. I, I mean, we don't write collaborative soprano, so I don't really feel like we need to write collaborative. There is no such thing. <laughs> right? right. <laughs> I've never met a collaborative soprano. Mezzo <laughs> maybe, but... <laughs> <laughs> right. I, 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 I'm, I don't mind the word accompanist. I never have. My degrees from uh, Gwen's uh, teaching from, from USC say uh, a master's in accompanying. I don't mind that at all. I, I feel that that's just fine. The next question is, you spoke of it, maybe you, I didn't hear everything, but I have been present countless times either as call it a judge, call it an adjudicator, or sure. just a member of the audience at competitions in which clearly the pianist and the singer are not on the same page. Yeah. Now, a lot of times what happens is they are paired together 30 minutes or even two right. minutes or sometimes two days before their right. performance, and they have to find each other. And in the case of the singer, he or she is usually nervous and, and is trying to win something. Yes. And the pianist has to play 14 different pieces in 14 different styles uh, yes. that he or she will have looked at for the past three days. Now, many of them, you know, Schubert songs and such will be familiar or mm -hmm. I do for right. Gilded and Rigoletto, the, these works that are beginning singers music. But a lot of times they'll bring in, you know, the latest John Adams or some obscure handle. And when you're playing let's take those two, uh, Gary Friedrich Handel and John Adams, the whole musical structure and style are completely different. Yes. And you, the pianist, have to bring that. And yeah. you also have to, I think, try to bring the mood of the song. Yes. Whether it's an emotional moment like Gilda singing Caro Nome and expressing her love for this boy she saw, saw at church. Or sometimes in the case of a Handel aria, it might just be about the emotional buildup through repetition and change of speed and change of meter or change of key that yes. will indicate something new dramatically. How do you and your colleagues who do this jump into that deep body of water without a life preserver to do something <laughs> musically effective? Wow, that's such a great question and such a, a I could speak probably for an hour. I promise I won't. Um, uh, I, I think it has to do mostly with preparation, with really as much as possible being prepared with repertoire. As you mentioned, you can't always be prepared if it's a new work or if it's a very obscure piece. Uh, chances are you may be sight reading or you may be uh, seeing the style for the first time uh, right there. But still, you're bringing a lot of preparation in terms of experience of how to negotiate that. And I think it has to do with really understanding um, uh, you need to offer as the accompanist in that scenario, you need to offer a very clear groundwork, a, a firm foundation, and the singer can show you tempo or show you phrasing, show you breathing. Um, the clearer their performance is in terms of their phrasing, their dynamics, their breathing, the better you'll be able to serve it. But the other thing I would say is that I think when one is adjudicating, when one is listening, and this would to me be not only competitions, but also in auditions for casting, etc., uh, especially companies that are providing an accompanist and know very well that none of the singers they're hearing have had a chance to rehearse and to be coached uh, by the same person that's playing for them. It's an understood um, uh, element of what's happening. And I think people listening have a, a, a way of listening to a singer and being able to hear what the instrument is, what the talent is, what the artistry is, whether or not the performance in progress is something that you would want to hear on a concert stage and, and a really un understanding that something that might not have the utmost polish or the, the, the utmost 
performance level uh, uh, collaboration, nonetheless can really reveal exactly what you need to know about the singer. And sometimes really because of that, you can see that a singer perhaps um, is a little bit uh, uh, flummoxed by the situation and a little bit unnerved. And that's a signal to you about their level of experience or their level of, of personality. Or you can see them rising to the occasion and saying, oh, this isn't really my tempo, but I'm going to forge ahead and make this work. Or this isn't my tempo, let me see if I can influence it and bring it to what my tempo really is. And that's actually very valuable and very useful information to hear when you're, you're in a situation of trying to assess um, where an artist is. So I think partially the answer is to do the best work that you know to do, but also to not be distracted by the realization that you may not be giving this particular singer the perfect accompaniment that they would love to have if you had had the advantage of, of uh, a sufficient amount of rehearsal. I think I've lost you, Fred. So another way that um, uh, one can, can handle that is, is to really know as a pianist uh, what information you need to do your job as best you can. So even if it's actually on stage, to ask very specific questions of the soloist and say, um, that would particularly have to do with say ornaments or a cadenza in an aria, a Baroque piece, um, perhaps asking about a breath, sometimes in, in certain repertoire, uh, very famously, some singers do breathe, some singers don't, and to just get that information, to perhaps try to get a sense of what the real tempo that the singer would prefer is, even if you don't verbally communicate it perfectly to each other, to just have a sense. And sometimes that little interaction is just the most valuable thing to dif uh, diffuse any tension or any nervousness and just let the singer see from you through your eyes and your speaking voice, I'm here with you, I'm here for you. And to, to just have that moment, I think that's really important, just as a singer might in a, in a recital performance, um, turn to the pianist between songs and maybe there isn't actually any verbal interaction, but just eye contact and a sense of, we're partners, we're here making this happen together can really, in a really interesting way, help both people to come together, even if you are still jumping into something a little bit unknown and unproven, you do at least have a sense that you're doing it with a friend and not uh, you know, a complete and utter stranger. So that can be a helpful thing. So John, I'm gonna interrupt. Uh-huh. John, I'm gonna interrupt you if I may. Sure. Mm -hmm. John, I'm going to interrupt if I may. Okay. The Wi-Fi here in New York is very funky today. Okay. Um, therefore, I know that our listeners are benefiting from all the wonderful things you are saying. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard any of them. So, <laughs> but I know that you your connection has been working well. Okay. And I'm I know that when I watch it, it'll be great. But <laughs> if I'm about to ask you things that just don't correlate with what you were just talking about, please okay. understand why. Um, sure. So I'm going to move away from the question of accompanying because I know okay. you covered it very well and go to the concepts of being a chorus director. Sure. And how did you evolve to that? And what is the difference between a chorus director and a chorus master? And uh -huh. Talk about that trajectory and some of the work that's involved in it. Ah, oh, fantastic. Uh, it's a really interesting thing because I often ask myself, how did I end up here <laughs> and why? Um, I, I think the broadest thing I could say is that my desire has always been to work artistically at the highest possible level. 
And luckily as a pianist and then later a conductor, I have a lot of options in terms of whether I'm a rehearsal repetiteur or whether I'm a vocal coach, whether I'm a concert performance accompanist, whether I'm a conductor and whether that means an assistant conductor to major uh, international maestri or whether I'm uh, just out of, out of experience and age assisting people before I move into my own work. Um, there are so many pathways and, and chorus master, chorus director uh, pathway is one of those. And I just found that it really combines the things I love the most, which are singing, which I know sounds sounds very generic, but but I, I just adore the human voice and and the fact that this art form is so much generated by and designed around uh, the human voice singing. Um, that plus the fact that I know that I have a, a gift for teaching and for coaching and that I actually think of a chorus rehearsal as basically a very large group coaching <laughs> much of the time. Uh, it seemed to sort of bring together all the things that I, I think I'm skilled at and that I actually love and have a passion for. I'm not sure that there's much difference between chorus master and chorus director. It might a lot be similar to accompanist and collaborative pianist. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I think uh, in a company the size of San Francisco Opera, for example, where I am now, uh, the director word kind of signifies an overall responsibility for everything that the chorus does, not just in terms of artistry on stage, but also um, auditioning, uh, uh, administrative oversight of, of the, the tenured choristers, uh, children's chorus, et cetera, a whole umbrella of, of things. I think a chorus master term might be more geared toward literally what you do in performance mode and what you do um, uh, in literal rehearsal mode. So it's uh, probably not a very large distinction, but maybe that's that's where that came from. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to talk about the chorus and, and what I do, because I think, as you said, it's something that uh, the, the public doesn't see. It's It all happens behind the scenes. I think, of course, any opera lover and any attendee of opera sees a chorus and hears a chorus on stage, but the idea that they have to be prepared um, and, and actually extremely prepared, uh, if you think of the fact that the orchestra, incredibly skilled musicians and incredibly experienced and highly gifted players, but they're all sitting uh, in the same chair all evening reading from a score, and the chorus is singing from memory, and acting and wearing, uh, you know, uh, stage makeup and a wig and costumes, probably multiple uh, throughout the evening. Their work is really complex in that way. And everything they do is from memory. So one of the biggest things that, that I feel responsible for is making sure a chorus is confident to perform from memory. And I don't mean on opening night, I mean, whenever their first staging rehearsal is for a given production, that they are they are confident that they can work from memory and provide an openness to a director and a, and a maestro to start to shape the production and, and shape their work. And that's an incredible amount of hours spent of repetition and drill and, and things that might feel on paper a little bit dry, but they're, they're fascinating and it's fascinating the group uh, aspect of it, the, the group psychology of bringing a lot of really gifted, talented people who have to learn to work together and work together as an ensemble, just like an orchestra. Um, it's actually kind of a funny thing that we we sometimes will talk about little things that happen, personalities or or whatever. And I always end up saying the same thing, which is, look, we're, we hire singers because they're gifted performers and they have extravagant, larger than life personalities. So let's maybe not be too surprised if sometimes there are little little um, uh, moments where those two, uh, two or four or six personalities bump into each other. I actually think it's just a good indication of the fact that we've got really gifted people who are performing on stage. But my job ends up being trying to encourage everybody to 
become on and stay on the same page and to form an ensemble that is going for the same artistic uh, goals and understands what those are. Um, never a dull so, moment. I'm going to interrupt again. My sound has been spotty. I think okay. I kind of know what you said, but sure. um, I'm going to take it from one thing I heard you say. Let's okay. say that you're coaching the chorus on an opera such as La Traviata, uh -huh. in which they might be a certain character in Act One, right. and they might be a different character in Act Two, Scene Two. In other words, there are different parties. Yes. One of them is Violetta's party. It's a little more herben, as the Italians say. <laughs> and the other one is the tawdry party at Flores. Yeah. And you might have the same chorister, but in a different costume, perhaps different makeup, different yeah. wig, and yeah. decidedly enacting different things. Those are two party scenes, but there might be other operas like Eugene Onegin by Tchaikovsky, mm -hmm in which they go from being peasants to nobility, and it's a much bigger stretch. Yes. Do you work with the, with your chorus singers on that as well? I do. I, I We generally talk about that from a musical standpoint, and I respect the fact that a stage director and and the the costume designer and the 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 costume department and the and the hair and makeup department are going to work their own magic uh, physically, as you described, in creating different uh, different characters. But I talk with them a lot from, from a musical vocal standpoint of colors and how we use the language, how we express, uh, you know, the, the, the Onegin is a great example because that phenomenal opening scene when they start off stage and enter and are, are singing with this most beautiful, full-throated, warm, um, sound but they're expressing how tired they are and from from hard manual labor and so to get that that sense that they're they're as a group kind of allowing themselves to really express we achieved something really great but at the expense of being literally totally exhausted and then yes an hour later they're on stage in completely different um dress and they are now uh noble and what does that do to their to their singing in terms of how they deliver the, the material that the composer gave them. And I think a lot of it comes back to the composer. I think that, uh, you know, Verdi and Tchaikovsky are two great men of the theater who understood how to musically craft those different characterizations. And it's our job to make sure we're respecting what they wrote. What happens when you have an opera where the chorus might be a mess of people? And then they might be expressing the same thing. Let's say the closure, the closing of La Clemenza di Tito or of Di Zaba Flotta or a lot of Wagner in which they're just the people adding vocal heft to yes. the situation. But there may not be as specific a dramatic impulse or motivation. They're just there for the sound. Yeah, well, I, I think we respect that fact and we really work on making sure that we have a beautiful, healthy, full, generous sound and that we really are supporting the stage and the, and the piece in the way that the composer needs for it to happen. But I also encourage them in those cases to really think about their individual response to the music. I personally, by definition, we need to form an ensemble where we come together and we are uh, collaboratively creating a unit, but I also think it's it's a it's a collection of individuals, you know. And I think just like the public, mm -hmm. uh, who they may be representing, maybe we're all at the same thing, but we have a variety of opinions about what's going on. We have a variety mm -hmm. of viewpoints of uh, maybe it's because we're different of generation, a different background of where and how we grew up. We respond differently to different things, and I think that's okay. I generally try to prepare the course so that the, I really allow them to do that and really encourage them to run with that. And then know that a maestro and a stage director in the rehearsal process can guide that to the ultimate um, place it needs to be to serve the particular production. But I prefer to let, let it be a little bit, um, I, I wouldn't say in raw form, but I would just say, I encourage the individuality up front, and then we can let that come more into focus as we see what's really necessary. 
But I just even as an audience member, I enjoy performances where I can see individual members of the chorus not going rogue, not not sticking out or or detracting from the performance, but rather just individual personalities. It really it really makes me think and listen and and feel more deeply whatever the actual message is. And, and I will say, you know, there are people who talk about the opera chorus in a really general sense as being something that very often is representing the public, right? Is representing mm -hmm. a community or is, that's kind of their function. Like you think of Elixir of Love. Um, these are the people who live in this place where Nemarino is, is uh, trying to figure out how he can possibly be taken seriously by the most powerful and wealthy woman in the town. And uh, they, they have specific things to do on stage, but in a real general sense, they're, they're actually representing, I don't know if this is too much of a stretch, I don't think so. They're representing the audience. You know, it's, it, the, the audience is, can kind of feel like, yeah, that's how I would be observing this if I were, if I happened to be on stage. So although I've been around many choruses and chorus masters in the years, your comments have provoked three questions I've never asked one of you before. Okay. So here we go. All right. Um, when I worked at the Metropolitan Opera, there was a member of the chorus who did stick out and she liked to stick out yeah. and she had enough clout that she was able to get the director's to always place her downstage yeah. and the costumers to give her a different costume and the lighting designers to light her better. And I remember one time Dame Joan Sutherland was doing her famous mad scene from Lucia de Lamamour. And this particular chorus member was seated downstage front while the rest of the chorus were mostly standing. And this chorister was seated with her arms folded not reacting to the mad scene of Lucia, but just looking very disappointed with everything going on. Uh -huh. So how do you deal with a chorus member who feels entitled and feels that they, he, she should stick out? Or actually during performance, I can think of another chorus member that met no longer with them, who during the big crowd scenes at the end of Meistersinger and Fidelio, would rush forward to hug the tenor, even though she was not supposed to go anywhere near the tenor. And it was up to the woman, you know, <laughs> the Ava or the, the Leonora to interact with the tenor. But this chorus member would make a dash so that, you know, she could be seen. And she said, well, I was just so moved by the story and by the music. And we would say, you might be emotionally moved. You're not supposed to physically move. How do you yeah. deal with that? Um. Uh, you, you know, I feel like uh, I think this is really a truth that that kind of of behavior is very rarely seen now. I think it's really something that happened um, in the past. And it's it's it. Of course, it's uh, to some degree, it's really charming and it certainly makes for great stories. And it's kind <laughs> of, of uh, memorable if you see it happening. But I feel that that has kind of ended. And I think that many many, um, if not all, people who are working in the craft of, of singing in the chorus of, of the, the great houses of the world, they know uh, what the job description is, and they know that that wouldn't be, be really tolerated anymore. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I would say that, to, to answer your question more specifically, if that did happen, I would want to address it with the person directly by saying, look, I really understand your thought and your feelings, and I don't really mean to take those away from you, but you simply may not physically move from this position to which you were assigned, <laughs> or yeah. I'm sorry, but you will actually be wearing this costume, which looks identical to all the other ones, and yeah. there will be no more discussion, or you will not be on stage. That, that would be the answer. Got it. So that's question number one. You you inspired a lot of questions to me. Question number two, that I've never asked a chorus master before. We who work in the profession and we who attend performances have preconceived notions, whether they're accurate or not, 
about what sopranos are and mezzos are and contraltos are and tenors and baritones and basses by temperament, by ability to work well with others and so on. Do you see the comparable thing in chorus members who possess the different voices or is the chorus member personality different from the soloist personality? I think there's a difference. I don't see that so much by various vocal categories, I, but I do see it in individuals in the group for sure, but I don't see the same kind of typical, um, you know, uh, uh, definitions of that. I, I feel that there are just some people who have grand, larger than life personalities and, you know, that's why they're performers. That's why they have this career because they have that gift and, and, it has to be something a little bit over the top to read in a large theater and to be available to a director to use on stage. Um, but what I find is that in a really good way, I think the craft of being an operatic chorister has really developed significantly in the past decades, I'd say 20 plus years, 30 years even, um, to where there's a real professionalism of, of choristers knowing what the job needs, what their expectations are of them, and also what they can bring to it. And I, I feel like actually most of that stuff that we're talking about happens in the rehearsal room. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and, and it's kind of politics in that setting. And as, as distracting or as difficult as that can be sometimes just on an energy level of handling it, I kind of welcome that because it gets it out of our systems. And that means by the time we get on stage, that has all been uh, worked through, so to speak, and we can just be colleagues on stage and really do the, the, the work. And I find that that happens 99% of the time. Um, but but I I I know exactly of what you speak and yes every now and again and I think all of us and sometimes I would say maybe perhaps even the person in question finds it a little bit uh, uh, charming and entertaining that this is actually even happening that mm -hmm. it's just uh, uh, you know it's it's it comes with the territory I think if you're going to be a person who bears your soul to four thousand people uh, in public it stands to reason that you are going to sometimes be a little bit over the top in a room of 50 people. <laughs> <laughs> True. So technical question. This was not okay. in my list, but it came to me now. When we look at scores, to some degree in opera, but more often in choral music and vocal mm -hmm. music, you see terminology such as soprano one, soprano two, maybe alto one, alto two. Would mm -hmm. you talk about those categorizations? Are they higher sopranos, lower sopranos, or are they where they're placed or where they come in on a text? It's it's really usually about tessitura. In other words, the range in which they're singing. So a soprano one would be the highest pitch singing and a second soprano would be probably uh, a third or so lower, um, but higher than the altos or mezzo sopranos are singing. So it's generally a musical vocal designation of where the range of the music lies. It's not very often um, meant to be or to dictate a physical arrangement of people on the stage or their their entrances and exits in the in the ongoing drama. Um, one of the interesting things that I that I handle and all of my colleagues have the same situation is people who are professional choristers sometimes come with a real strong sense of self. I am a second soprano. I am a first tenor. I am a bass baritone or I am a second bass, meaning I sing the lowest possible pitch at all times. Um, other times there are people who have an amazing flexibility of Yes, I'm I'm a first soprano, but I'm fine if you assign me to second soprano or vice versa. Uh, we even have uh, times when um, uh, all the mezzo sopranos, all the altos in the chorus might be singing in unison with the sopranos. So there is a real need for voices. Because they can. Because they can. <laughs> and, and sometimes because the composer, for better or worse, has assigned them to do so. And sometimes it's a, a lovely... Uh, a lovely and wonderful thing. And sometimes you wonder what a composer was thinking about how those people, how those people's instruments work. But I, I think that's something that a, that a choral singer 
does bring to the table that's a little different than a soloist. A soloist is really invested in their, their very unique individual voice and how that works. And yep. a choral singer is aware that though they may have the same parameters, that they're going to be asked at various times to do things that might feel less than ideal. And that rather than to say immediately, I can't or I won't, they know that it's actually necessary and they will find a way and have found a way technically um, to handle that kind of thing. And and I, I, I think it's actually one of, uh, again, not so much a debit, but actually one of the great interesting things that, that a chorister in the course of one season might find themselves vocally handling a wide variety of situations. And they they gain, I think, a lot of not only pleasure and, and satisfaction from it, but also a real pride of mm -hmm. I'm able to handle that. Well, I've known and enjoyed more than a few mezzo soloists who say to me, in effect, I can sing her music, meaning yes. the soprano. I just don't have to. Yes. But I can. Yes. And she can't sing my music, but I can sing her music. And that yes. is very often the case. Very often. You know, I, I remember many years ago in New York, I played for uh, a mezzo soprano who was a very famous in her she, I think it was um she was Bulgarian and she had most of her career sung in in Bulgaria and she was in New York for the first time and she sang for auditions Visi d'arte and uh suicidio and uh from La Gioconda yeah. from La Gioconda and I think there were, I I can't remember the the third she had a, a list of her R's and they were all soprano pieces. And she said, I know, I know I will never sing these roles and I'm not trying to, I'm not asking to be cast in them, but they show my instrument. And she was really uh, disconcerted by the response that she would get in, in America of, we love hearing it, it's beautiful. And we hear the beauty of your voice, but we need to hear you sing your actual stage repertoire. And, and I yeah. think her feeling was, well, of course I can sing Carmen. That's what, that's all I sing. But I, I would rather <laughs> sing Visi d'Arte for you. Sure. And so to your point, yes, many instruments can sing a wide variety of things and uh, much more than we hear uh, in the finished product. Now, my next question comes in two parts. Okay. We'll start with one direction, then go in the opposite direction. Okay. I have known members of choruses, primarily the Met and La Scala, where I work the most, who clearly had terrific voices beyond that of singing in the chorus. Nothing wrong with singing the chorus, but they had a lot of extra going on. <laughs> and in fact, they're known as extra chorus. And there's one fellow currently singing at the Met who I met when he came to New York not long ago. And he was an usher at the Met. Hmm. And, and I, one of my jobs decades ago was I was the boss of the ushers at the Met. Hmm. And so I know the ushers and I designed their uniform. And I, you know, I talked to all the ushers there and I was chatting with him. And within 30 seconds, I said, you're a singer, aren't you? He said, yes, I am. And I said, so you're, he's from North Carolina. Hmm. You are in the ushering staff because you want your way into the med he said yes i do and i said are you auditioning for the chorus yes i will and he did and he got in as extra chorus so some nights you see him on the aisle on uh -huh. the north aisle of the orchestra and other nights you see him on stage in lowengrin or whatever opera he's in and the other night uh at champion the mm. new opera by terence blanchard excellent um there he was in a small role, which means that he had been hired, graduated, been noticed, maybe auditioned for this small but very good role. Mm -hmm. And so the question is the trajectory of chorus members into soloists. And it's not the thing of I'm going on replacing the man singing Votan tonight, but mm -hmm. I'm going on to sing Dr. Granville yes. uh, in a smaller but important role. Yes. Have you witnessed this in your career and how does that happen? Absolutely. I've, I've witnessed it constantly. And I think it's it's a part of the culture of what we do, that that will exist for all time. I think this is really generalizing, but I do think that that singers pursuing this as a career path professionally fall into two really large categories. One 
would be the ones who really are attracted to the idea of singing in the chorus, who would really, who really would like to be part of that and really value the ensemble nature of it, the collaborative nature of it, and who would prefer to not be uh, carrying the pressure and stress of solo assignments. And others who have, maybe, maybe it's even not so much that I really wanna be a soloist, but just haven't come yet to a decision. Where, where do I fall on that spectrum, especially younger singers? And I'll tell you, I, I think that um, the, the gentleman that you've described, that's a very classic thing that can happen. If you have the gift and the skills, uh, then if you, if you do audition, you will be noticed and those skills will continue to reveal themselves over time. When you sing your first audition, you probably won't be offered a solo role or some plum thing. Not because you're not satisfactory, but simply because nobody knows who you are and nobody knows what your work ethic is. Nobody knows what you will offer and what you bring to the table. So like any other profession, it's a question of just announcing yourself and then becoming known as a reliable and, and really professional um, colleague. But I will say one thing, which I think is really important. I often hear, especially young singers, and I even hear sometimes teachers, and I think less and less over time, but even in the past, I think certain young artist programs and training programs would somehow communicate this, that if you want a solo career, if you want to, to forge a career as an opera singer, you must avoid singing in the chorus because you will become known as a chorister. And I find that heartbreaking because uh, it means that you are refusing work which could help support you in your in your trained and chosen field. You're uh, skipping a lot of wonderful hands-on experience. I mean, maybe your dream is to be Marilyn Horn, and that's a wonderful dream. That's I, my I, dream. That's <laughs> mine too. Time seems to be running out, so I'm kind of pressing the gas pedal on that. But, um, uh, but you know what? There is. Uh, why wouldn't you want to be on stage with Marilyn Horn mm -hmm. and and learn at a distance how that works and what's what's involved and and also the craft of what we do? Why wouldn't you want the experience? And also, by the way, the whole time to be paid for it. How to interact with stage management? How to inter interact with the costume department? How to work with a dresser? How to work with a makeup artist? How to take stage direction, how to work with administrative uh, staff members, and just to become a great colleague and to learn that side of our business so that if you find yourself succeeding with solo opportunities, you have this incredible um, foundation already in place. I don't think that they're incompatible. And I think if there ever was uh, a sense that you somehow would be branded as a chorister and therefore not offered solo opportunities, I think those days have mercifully passed and that that people who are casting and who are in artistic administration in the important places know that they're exactly as you said, there are amazingly wonderful voices and talents, mm -hmm. uh, not only in the chorus, but also auditioning for the chorus every year. And it's yep. a, a good idea for them to pay attention to that. So here's to the flip side of the question. I have known personally <clears throat> and worked with three wonderfully gifted women who were all single mothers and uh, one, two sopranos, one mezzo. Mm. And they were no longer with their husbands. Um, their financial circumstances changed. They were soloists. But they mm. went and auditioned for and joined the Metropolitan Opera Chorus uh -huh. because it provided stability that they were able to know their working hours, look after their kids, yes. have a steady income, have health insurance, yes. have many of the things that solo artists do not have. Have yeah. you encountered this phenomenon? And what does that say to you about these chorus members who were you know, it's kind of like a chorus line, the Broadway musical, where Cassie, I think is the character's name, was a soloist and she wants to join the col uh, the chorus line because she says, I really need this job. Oh, God, I need this job. Yeah. And there's that. Yes. 
Yes, I, I have a great respect for that. I think that it's a wonderful thing that our profession can offer that to people. Um, in other words, if, if you find for financial reasons or for, as you said, the stability of being in one place and not having to travel constantly, of of taking care of a family, especially smaller children, um, uh, maintaining a personal relationship. Sometimes it's being a caretaker for a parent or an, uh, an older person. Yep. Um, I think it's wonderful that there are these options and you don't have to say, oh, well, I'll have to give up my performing career and do something completely different. I can still stay in this craft and be a, a part of this art form and earn a living and forge a career. I, I think it's a wonderful thing. And I think what's really important is that every individual person is really clear with themselves about what their needs are and what their intentions are. And I think the only time that there is a problem is when somebody isn't totally in touch with that and isn't kind of clear. And then there can be possibly some wires crossed or miscommunications. But I think it's just wonderful. And I see colleagues and friends that I know had had significant success as soloists who choose exactly as you said, to join the chorus. As a chorus director, I welcome that because I welcome, of course, the quality of their voices but also they are bringing such a wealth of stage experience and um, craft, probably a detailed knowledge of uh, a lot of the repertoire that they will be doing. Um, they, they serve as great role models and mentors for other people in the chorus. I welcome that mix uh, uh, in the chorus and I think it's a wonderful thing. And like I said, I'm just really thrilled when people can make their personal life run smoothly and still be connected to to the work that we do. Yeah, that is not easy at all. Not um, easy. No. Another interesting career trajectory that we won't deal with today, but I'm, I'm mentioning it because the public may not know about this. I've known more than a few dancers in the corps de ballet of opera companies, as opposed mm. to belonging to ballet companies, mm. who, when they no longer were dancing transition to become either dressers mm -hmm. or makeup artists, mm -hmm. but especially dressers mm -hmm. where they, you know, there was a very famous tenor who was dressed by the former lead dancer at the Met mm -hmm. um, because this lead dancer knew the backstage, knew all the people, knew how the theater worked. And for him, it was a natural transition uh -huh. And here was someone who was dancing the lead Naida and Samson, Delilah and old Carmen. And, you know, at a certain point, he then moved and became a dresser for tenors. Amazing. I yeah. see. I think that's, that's one of the things that attracted me to working in opera when I was young, not specifically dressing or, or those, those, those specific uh, paths, but just the awareness that it's such a big, uh, all embracing art form. It takes so many people and so many different crafts and different talents and all are equally necessary. We, we couldn't do it without those people. So it's not as if any there's a pecking order of importance. Um, and I think it's wonderful when people have that level of commitment and passion for the art form in general, that they can find a way to make a transition and, and still offer their skill and their experience and I, I just, I admire that. And I, I think I can't stop right now to think about it, but I think probably there are a bunch of people that are some of my favorite people and favorite colleagues because they just have that sense of the bigness of what we do and the awareness that this is what I do, this very specific track, but I know about the person who's doing X over there. It's and kind of like the character of Kundry in Wagner's Parsifal. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, that's exactly mm -hmm. that's exactly it. It's 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 um being able to know uh what's needed and to know that I actually could fulfill that. I actually could I could um help make that work. I think we might be frozen just now.
So another another uh, example would be um, people who train as performers, who train as whether it's singers or instrumentalists uh, or, or pianists, coaches, who find that they have an interest in administrative work and working in artistic administration or other areas of the administrative side of a company. That's an also very uh, uh, typical career shift that people make, which I think is a wonderful thing. I mean, how fantastic if an artistic administrator, as an example, has that depth of training, um, knows what it feels like to stand on stage and deliver, uh, and the expectations of what that work is, and a, and a breadth of knowledge of the repertoire, um, all of that. I think that's another really fascinating and excellent uh, option that that a lot of people are taking advantage of, and it's fantastic. So I want my listeners to know that John Keene is the ultimate professional, because my Wi-Fi in New York today has been awful, <laughs> and so he's been speaking to you and entertaining you basically on his own, and I thank you, because uh, <laughs> I will go back and hear this after, and I know you're, I can't not ask you questions <laughs> based on what staff with surrounded by gremlins pizzica pizzica stuzica stuzica i i i i <laughs> john what i want to do for the, what <laughs> i often feel like through john falstaff <laughs> or kundry but that's another story um what i want to do for the balance of our conversation <laughs> is um there are five operas that you selected mm. that listeners can find on our page, uh, along with recordings that I helped you select because I, I wanted to. Uh, I'm going to say them quickly before the sound goes out. Wagner's Lohengrin, Bizet's Carmen, Verdi's Rigoletto, the Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, and Benjamin Britten's Peter Grimes. And these are four of the first operas you've worked on. The fifth one, Peter Grimes, you've not but it's one that you would want to work on. Yeah. In each case, I selected recordings on the Adagio catalog that originated in the country where the opera or the language originated. Mm -hmm. So that we have the Bayreuth chorus for Lohengrin. We have the uh, national chorus of the opera of France, uh, Carmen. We have the Machu Musicale in Florence for Rigoletto. We have the Houston Grand Opera, an excellent one for Porgy and Bess. And we have the Royal Opera Covent Garden for Peter Grimes. Perfect. Start, John, with Lohengrin and talk about, number one, why this opera from a choral point of view, but also how do you work Lohengrin? Uh, I, I chose Lohengrin because it's uh, the, it's one of the longest assignments for the chorus in the repertoire. They're on stage probably more or at equal to all the principles. Um, they have as much music to sing and memorize as any of the principal soloists. And therefore they are a major factor in, in a successful performance. Not to mention the fact that Wagner wrote these, as we were speaking about earlier, a massive uh, amount of choral sound to support uh, the action uh, and, and libretto. Um, he showed his virtuosity as a composer, writing a divided men's chorus, literally all divided in four parts. So there's eight part men's chorus singing, which for an operatic chorus is a really strongly detailed assignment. You know that you've got, let's say, 80 men on stage, but uh, because they're in eight parts, that means only 10 of them are each singing the same part. Um, that requires a lot of rehearsal and a lot of musical sophistication and a lot of detailed memory and and um, confidence of, of, of the chorus. But also it's just glorious music, as we all know. And it's yeah. a wonderful treat for the chorus to sing um, long stretches, long architectural sections of something that really allow them to make a statement as a chorus rather than responding to or inserting small, uh, reactions to other people, they're able to make true statements. And I think they find that so gratifying. And as a chorus director, I find it a wonderful title to help build 
cohesiveness in a chorus and to build a beautiful choral blend. That's a, it's a great title for that. Um, now, was Carmen, the, the, Carmen, what I want to ask you about, but Carmen, number one, the language, but number two, children's choruses and that yeah. whole world. Yeah. Talk about yeah. how you work with the children's chorus. Number one, how you teach them. Number two, their stamina. Number three, their language comprehension. And number four, when their voices change. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I actually don't prepare the children from the beginning. They're prepared by their own chorus masters and then they join us in progress. And I, I do a musical rehearsal, uh, helping them understand how they're gonna integrate with the orchestra and sometimes with the adult chorus if they sing at the same time. Um, but yes, it, it really is a, a different sort of approach in terms of teaching them the foreign language, uh, what they need to understand musically in terms of following a conductor and what they're going to hear from the orchestra. You know, we, we take for granted with the adult choristers that they understand uh, hearing the piano in rehearsal and the change to the orchestral colors when they come to a Zitzprobe and the onstage rehearsals. But children, of course, don't, don't have that experience. So to really explain that to them and help them to know what to listen for, what instruments they might particularly notice and help them find a pitch or help them really hear tempo like uh, piccolo or flute or percussion. Um, uh, mostly it's really fun because they're so thrilled to be doing it. And it's such a special uh, thing for them to do. And it's, it's a really kind of uh, inspiring thing to see their energy and their their just the joy of of performing. It's usually a really wonderful thing. The the changing of voice is an unavoidable reality of life, and usually it's a little bit heartbreaking because it happens to people <laughs> who now have some experience and would like to keep going, and they think all of a sudden everything is over. But if they have a real passion and a real talent. Um, oftentimes they, they find out that what happened is that they have now been gifted a new, even more beautiful, more expressive voice. They might have to take some time to train that and to become comfortable with that physically, but it doesn't mean the end. And that's usually what I try to tell them is that um, try not to be discouraged or to be upset, but rather embrace this new challenge and all will be well if, if you really want it to be. So um, what I'm about to say may sound rude. I don't mean it for it to be rude, but it sounds okay. rude. When I've worked with animals, <laughs> <laughs> the good ones, like the good dogs, <laughs> are trained to look in a direction, usually at his or her trainer. Yeah. So very often you'll see a dog in an opera production not looking at the person he belongs to in the yes. opera, but looking straight ahead at the trainer who's giving signs or indications yes. from the side. Yeah. Similarly, <laughs> I have seen children's choruses all looking in the same direction. So when they're surrounding Baron Ox and saying, Papa, Papa, and they're yes. supposed to be clinging to him, yes. they're looking off into the middle distance like the trained dog. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's probably because their chorus master trainer is off stage <laughs> conducting very, very big and clear so that they can, so that they can, uh, I, I think that's part of the live performance scenario of, of opera that yes, it would be wonderful if the children could be magical little actors and play a realistic scene like with Ox or whoever it might be. Yeah. But the best and most important thing is that they are musically coordinated with what's yeah. going on. And uh, that's what has to be preserved. Sometimes it's actually the prompter who yes. is, is going to be like if in Carmen, if they come out in the opening uh, in act one to sing the march, they're often very far downstage and they're right where a prompter can help them very mm -hmm. clearly. And you'll see them kind of looking in that little box. Um, <laughs> uh, and that's or okay. Or Bohem, all looking in act two, all looking to one side. Yes, yes. <laughs> Except yes. for the Parpignol kid. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Who yes. turns and sings to the audience and then turns right back and looks at... <laughs> yeah. We're yeah. saying this, listeners, so that you, when you go to the opera, can the more you look the more you see and the more you see the more you understand when people say opera is quote not realistic even though it definitely is um why they're looking that way in that time in that moment yeah um 
teaching French to a chorus cannot be easy. It's not easy. Even if it's their native language, it cannot be easy. What yeah. are the pitfalls of French? I think the pitfalls of French are that it's a very legato, liquid language, and and the stress, the inflection is very subtle, so not terribly operatic by nature, and tends to come at the end of a sentence or the end of a phrase, and very different than German or English or Italian, where there are multiple inflections in a phrase, and they're much stronger and more defined. So I find that most of the time, it's not so difficult to teach the sounds and and the the but what's difficult is to get rid of um sort of germanic uh english types of strong accent and strong articulation could you and give I, an example either spoken or sung as you wish it doesn't have to be from carmen it could be any french um, opera but uh gosh i i let me think of a french phrase that's um well, I think even something like um, a command, like laisse toi, leave, leave, leave that alone or, or go away. Um, if we can master the sound of laisse toi, that's not so hard. Mm -hmm. What's hard is to, is to prevent people who don't have French as a native language from saying laisse toi, mm -hmm. laisse toi and giving an explosive sound of the T and also giving a really heavy, uh, thick accent to express the, the emotion of it and rather just trust that to speak it clearly is, is what, what is really needed. Actually, the big, best example I can think of is that I once had in a chorus, um, a French Canadian singer, fantastic baritone who had to leave for a family emergency. And he came back and he said to me, my father has hyperpressure and he was in the hospital. And I realized this is the perfect, every, <laughs> it's the final syllable of every phrase yeah. is getting, and that's exactly what the French language needs and exactly what the English language doesn't have. And it was just a perfect, to me, encapsulation of, of what we try to do. Um, I, I will say the other thing about French is the nasal vowels. Yeah. And generally speaking, because we don't have them at all in our own language, we tend to really exaggerate them and say, I want to make sure everybody hears that I have sung this nasal vowel, which mm -hmm. means it's probably about 400% more than is really necessary. And it's really... Um, so par exemple? Uh, 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 even something as simple as mon coeur, the, the, the beginning Je of... Je à ta voix. Yeah, more, <laughs> more, more, you know, really exaggerated um, or, or really vocally trying to place it because it's called a nasal vowel, trying to place it close to the nose or in the nose and, and inhibit the vocal sound when it's really it's this very liquid legato um, sound. Um, uh, another thing I'll just say, and I don't think it's re restricted to French, I think it's it's chorus singing in general in foreign languages. Um, very often choristers become very extremely concerned about the fact that they're maybe not exactly in unison with pronunciation and diction issues with their colleagues around them. I'm hearing this, I'm hearing that. Um, and I spend a, a lot of time trying to convince choristers that I in no way mean to contradict them or am implying that I don't respect what they're hearing, but the actual importance is what the aggregate sound is doing. And in a funny way, I actually value often those varying individualities because they add together as a wonderful mix. And yeah. if everybody was doing exactly the same thing at the same time, it probably in many cases would be an exaggeration of what's mm -hmm. needed. So, so it's, it's to me kind of like cooking in that sense of, of, um, you know, sp adding spices and how much is enough and which combinations very personal and very interesting, how just a little tiny shift in that can change the whole overall effect. Um, mm -hmm. So that's something I deal with a, a lot. And I think happens more with French probably than any other yeah. language. I know I, when I speak French, I my language skill is good in French. My pronunciation is absolutely awful. The worst of the languages I speak, it's just not even close. 
but French people tend to say to me, not, oh, you're an American, but, oh, you're from Italy. Because ah. apparently my vowels, when I speak them in French, are Italian vowels. Uh -huh. And 98% of the French people I talk to think I'm from Italy because I do speak fluent Italian. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to me that that's what was replaced. I learned my French in the United States initially, uh -huh. not in Italy. Right. I learned my Italian in Italy, but I learned my French in Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's a challenge. I just can I cannot find my way through the thickets of French vowels. You know, I think it's I think it's so much the fact that it's not our native musculature. And I mean, if you think of, of Charles Boyer and, and actors in the old movies who could perform a whole scene with a cigarette yeah. <laughs> uh, in their lips without letting it fall, it's because this musculature is so highly developed. We have hundreds of muscles in this part of the face that in English, you know, I can basically talk to you right now and hardly anything is moving, right? But you understand what I'm saying. Whereas with a French person, th th this embouchure and the, the forward position of the lips is pretty much constant. And these muscles are highly, highly developed. So you hear at rest or, or, or kind of neutral biding time syllables in American English, we say, um, uh, and a French person will say, uh, 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 uh. uh, uh, uh. this is already in position. And, and we don't really utilize, we use much more inside the mouth um, articulators. And that's, I think, a big portion of why it, that happens. And similarly, when I go to French films, which I love, um, there are certain actors and actresses, even the very best ones, I don't know what they're saying. Catherine yeah. Deneuve, for example, I love everything she does, but I don't know what she's saying. Yes. Whereas Gerard Depardieu, a problematic actor in some ways, and doesn't move his mouth much, I understand all of his French. Yes. And I've never quite known why that is. He came to New York a few years ago and did a program at Carnegie Hall with Chicago Symphony and Ricardo mm -hmm. Muti narrating uh, Berlioz. Oh. And it was gorgeous to listen to yeah. because I understood all of his French from the stage at Carnegie Hall. Yeah. So let's go now to Rigoletto, which is uh, a magnificent opera. And the oh version God. we have is the Maggio Musicale Fiorentino Chorus from about 1960. So it's really, as the Italians say, echt. It was the <laughs> real deal. Um, the real deal. John Andrea Gavazzini, an incredibly idiomatic Italian conductor, and Ettore Bastianini, Renato Scotto, plus the tenor Alfredo Kraus. Fiorenza Cosalto. This is the most Italian production I know of Rigoletto. Yeah. Rigoletto. Yeah. And um, how do you work that show where you have mixed chorus, but you have the choristers playing big characters? Yes. Um, well, I, I think the, the biggest thing about uh, Verdi and, and actually Italian, uh, Italian operatic singing in general for the chorus, but specifically Verdi because he writes rhythmically for the course. It's not, not long cantilena lines. Um, it's really trusting that the inflection of the natural speech quality is of vital importance and it doesn't always match what you're seeing notated in the musical score. Mm -hmm. And because all of us who are trained in the United States and, and I would say actually any European uh, Western European conservatory type training, we all have that kind of Germanic heritage where we are taught that a quarter note is exactly a quarter note and an eighth note is an eighth note and a rest means exactly what it looks like. And if it has a dot, it is definitely staccato. And if it has a line above it, it's definitely lengthened and made a tenuto, et cetera. And actually um, for most Italian composers in opera, it's it's a shorthand, and it's 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 known that particularly the chorus as a group will understand to release a final syllable and let it be light and short, even if it's not written that way. Even if it was say written as two quarter notes, they will definitely perform something closer to a quarter note and an eighth note. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
And I find that often there's a conflict. I can watch it on the faces of my chorus. I can see them saying, I want to do what I think is right and what, I, what I'm hearing in the language, but the music is showing me that those should be two quarter notes. Mm -hmm. And there's this definite uh, conflict. So that's, to me, one of the great things about the recordings that we have from the era that you're speaking of, and Gavazzini and Maggio Musicale, but also Scala and, and the other great theaters, is to hear those choruses sing um, their native language, as opposed to what you see when you look at the vocal score, mm -hmm. and to understand they weren't ignoring the vocal score, they were bringing it to life and, and yeah. making sure that it had the Italian um, energy and and uh, uh native ownership that that it needs to have and so i i listen to that all the time to remind myself of what that sound is and what that what that respect is for the language next opera which you said an amazing chorus is the gershwins ira and mm -hmm. george gershwin and dubose hayward's porgy and bess yes which premiered in 1935 it had an all-black cast except for two acting roles um the Gershwin estate specified that a special chorus be hired of black people of African Americans although they're not all American which is why said persons of color persons of African descent um and this is an expensive undertaking number one number two the chorus has to be specifically trained to the ways of the theater where they're performing and they may be sourced from local churches and african-american choirs in the cities where they are a uh, part of why i selected this production which was a fantastic one that houston grand opera did in houston and brought to new york and i saw it at George clamadale mm -hmm. we forget clamadale but she was an amazing best and donnie ray albert and it was called on the recording the houston grand opera chorus when you have worked on Porgy and Bess, what have been the special conditions of hiring, auditioning, and then training, and then performing? Well, I, it, it always is a special project for exactly as you describe of hiring um, a specifically ethnically appropriate chorus, people who identify as, as um, ethnically uh, racially black, and. Uh, always of course using the people already in the company who can identify that way and then supplementing with auditions um i feel that it's one of the great things about it is welcoming those those who maybe didn't feel always welcomed or always heard or always um included uh really welcoming them into the opera house and hopefully bringing them into the opera house longer term and mm -hmm. um I, I did the last time i did porgy was in seattle and uh, it just so happened that the production immediately prior to the porgy was aida and so i just made it a point to every chorister that i hired to sing in porgy i offered a contract to sing in aida as well mm -hmm. to just make sure that there was this um uh open door of of please join us some not interested, some not able to accept it, et cetera. But, but there were a large number who, who did and could, and I was so happy about that. Um, it's a masterpiece, this piece. Yeah. I, it, it's, uh, you know, I still hear people debating about musical opera. I, I, I kind of don't care, but actually, mm -hmm. if it's not an opera, I don't know what it is. It's, it's, it's definitely it is an opera. a glorious opera. Oh my gosh, exactly. Yeah. And, and, what it asks the chorus to do in terms of um, flexibility of style. I mean, they do everything in that opera from small character things where there's just little subgroups of the only the tenors and basses, uh, the, the craps game at the very opening, um, uh, the, the choreography that they're going to have to be at least minimally involved with, if not fully involved with, um, as you mentioned, stepping out into more soloistic uh, opportunities and then massed choral sound. But the biggest thing is just the subject matter and the libretto and the, the way Gershwin crafted the piece. There is just this amazing community that's represented, represented and shown on stage, which is an amazingly, overwhelmingly beautiful thing by the time they get to the end. And even though they know that Porgy is facing a hopeless situation and there is no good outcome 
from his desire to follow her and to try to rectify this. They don't judge that or tell him to stop or restrain him. They say, go. I'm on Lord, my I'm on my way. Bring me my goat, which in the yeah. current Met production, there's no goat. But in the production I worked on in the 80s, we had a goat. Uh -huh. And the goat did as it wished. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, but actually, I'm remembering that in the 80s, when we did it at the Met, contractually the members of the Met Chorus, including black members of the Met Chorus, could not sing in the Porgy oh, Chorus really? because they were members of the Metropolitan Opera Chorus under a different oh, contract. See. And the chorus that was engaged for Porgy and Bess were different. Then after the, the run ended, some of these people auditioned and joined the Metropolitan Opera Chorus. But I remember we had a black, very prominent member of the Met Chorus and um, she would exit the stage door. People would say, I'm not going to say her name, but, oh, you were so wonderful tonight. Well, thank you, honey. And she hadn't sung. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think it might actually be a real sign of, of the excellent progress of time yes. and the, welcome, the welcoming and embracing of all of us, including Finally. all of us. Yeah. Um, in the fact that now I think that doesn't happen anymore, and the yeah. the, the union that uh, that governs contracting and and that that would is is so on board with helping bring very diverse groups of people together and and making sure that they can be employed and, and offered as much work as as yep. humanly possible and exists and that, that everybody should be yeah. And finally, Peter Grimes, you've not uh, worked on. Um, the recording we have is, I had two picks. I could either have picked the recording that featured Peter Pears in the title yeah. role or the one with John Vickers, but it's not about that. It's the chorus that yeah. made me choose this one, conducted by Sir Colin Davis, not conducted by Benjamin Britten, um, with the chorus of the Royal Opera House at Covent Garden, which is where yeah. the opera premiered in 1945. I yeah. thought that was important. Absolutely. Uh, just away with the Bayreuth in Paris, these other yeah. things. Rigoletto did not premiere in Florence, it premiered in Venice, but all the others were pretty close to home. Yeah. And this one is at the Royal Opera House. Yeah. You've not worked on it yet. Why this one? Do you want to work on it? I mean, I, I know why, but you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, I, I, I have a special uh, attachment to Britain. I, I, I feel like his as as well respected and as famous already as that name is i feel like his real greatness as one of the titans of the not only the 20th century but just in the march of the repertoire is still to be totally revealed i i think mm -hmm. as time goes on he will become even more highly regarded of what he achieved um i just think peter grimes is a masterpiece a little bit in the same way as porgy very different subject matter and very different communities obviously but I think of representing a community of people on stage who become a literal, a character of the opera and who really are not sort of what we were talking about earlier in terms of representing the public at large in a sort of masked, generalized way, but very specifically showing how a group of people can embrace one outlook and one viewpoint of life and how how um, limiting and detrimental that can be. And the brilliant way he composed their music and the way he used their text. I, I feel like one of the things we haven't touched on, but I would just say that English for an English speaking chorus is actually still a foreign language when you're dealing yeah. with the stage and they have to really think of it that way. And Britain wrote in this way that uses the sound of English words to create musical statements and musical effects, and then also gives us amazing virtuosic, I think, uh, as a composer, divisi of, uh, you know, contrapuntal things and and things that seem innocuous, like a, the way children on the school, school ground might sing a, a round, you know, mm -hmm. but it's actually much more sophisticated and more yep. ongoing than that. Um, and just the way he dramatically uses that effect to, to show this kind of uh, circling in on your prey and and just kind of pointing this finger. It's it's not a pleasant uh, dynamic necessarily, but I think it's an incredibly 
potent one of our time, of yeah. the whole 20th century. And, and the fact that he was able to put that on stage and, and create a musical masterpiece that, that codifies that, I think is exactly what the great composers, Verdi, Puccini, Mozart, all of them did before him in their own time. And I just have such a respect for that. I, I would love the opportunity to work on it. I'm getting to the age where I feel like my list of uh, dream operas I haven't done may may follow me into the end and still remain on that list, but I still remain hopeful that it might it might come. I, I just would love the opportunity to be well, involved. I'm not going to put you on the spot, but Matthew Schilvach is a friend of mine. He's the head okay. of the San Francisco Opera, <laughs> and he was on the show a couple of years ago, and he's British. Yes. So, <laughs> Matthew, I'm going to send this video to you, and I think you want to start thinking about it. There are men in the world right now who are wonderful Peter Grimes's and um, Ellen Orford. There are many wonderful characters in this opera. And yes. uh, like Porgy and Bess, they're both poor fishing villages, which is very yes. interesting to me. Yes. The yes. presence of the sea exists in both operas yes. very strongly. There's a lot of singing about fish. <laughs> yes. yes. But it, it's it, they're both operas in their way about outsiders in very yes. different ways. Yes, one of them is absolutely. ostracized because of what he may have done. That's Peter Grimes. The other one, number one, faces institutional racism from the outside white community, but also because of his disability mm -hmm. that he's thought of as being, quote, less than by mm -hmm. crown and and not a man. And, and the way that terminology is used in the opera in very affecting ways, because, you know, Porgy, when he finally, spoiler alert, murders crown, says best. You got your man now. And that's that's what it's all about. It's part yeah. of what it's all about. Yeah. Bess is a magnificent character. Too. They're oh, all right. in that opera. They're all magnificent characters. It, it, I it, spoke a few years ago with Luella, and I'm suddenly forgetting her first name. Oh, Elizabeth. Uh, who, Luella, Elizabeth, yeah. thank you, who sang Bess at the Met, alternating with the wonderful Angel Blue. Yeah. And she explained to me, Elizabeth Llewellyn, who's British and Black, that her view of Bess is that she's a character who gets along better with men than women, and not just in the bed, but everywhere. everywhere. And that she's more comfortable in the man's world and understands its rules and negotiates it better than the tensions that she experiences with the women characters, which yeah. is a very interesting take on, on the character of Bess. Absolutely. Very, should be very valid. I never thought yes. about it before. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, John Keane, this has been terrific. And also, my admiration for soldiering through when I couldn't hear a word you said. <laughs> <laughs> I know you were great. I have no doubt. And I look forward to listening to it. <laughs> and I thank you. And I, I thank you also for giving listeners a much better idea of what's involved in being a chorus director, a chorus master, and being a great guy. That you've gotten far because pe I, people love you. Oh, when I say your name, you know, the hosannas that come forth throughout our profession, because, you know, if you, if you alienate people, it's known. But if, on the other hand, you're a wonderful colleague, um, that becomes known too. And oh, you so famously, kind. on the colleague scale, <clears throat> You're not a Kundry. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the ultimate colleague in all of opera opera characters? Oh my gosh. Um huh. that's a great question. Suzuki is my nominee in wow. the Madame Butterfly. Oh my gosh. That's a colleague. <laughs> that, that's A plus right there. <laughs> yes. That's the best okay. answer. I yeah. think I think Suzuki is the colleague of all colleagues. <laughs> She cooks, she cleans, she stands up for Madame Butterfly. Um, she sticks to her religion, even though, she, you know, Madame Butterfly has changed religions. She she does it all. She does it all. She really, she does everything. She takes care of the kid. Um, she negotiates with foreign military people. She's yes. really, she's the ultimate colleague. There we go. Now. Plus, she sees what's happening. Yep. and understands what's happening but doesn't let it 
become a, 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 a block in her love for for butterfly and her, her her relationship, which I I admire immensely. I don't mean that she should have interrupted and said, Duh! she just understands the tragedy that's unfolding. And yep. I think that's an amazing, amazing quality in a human being. But do you now, I mean, serious question. Do you think that Suzuki's choices and behavior enable Butterfly to do things that we don't want her to do? Or is Butterfly's choice, being an American as she is, more about self-determination or is she following japanese destiny that because of the shame that i haven't faced i have to do myself in oh my gosh i i think a lot of it i think it's mostly self-determination and she's just an incredibly strong human and who yeah. does have this conflict of her her upbringing her family who who attends her wedding and curses her um yeah. uh and and probably in some part of her does understand that this American um, uh, isn't necessarily completely trustworthy and isn't necessarily worthy of the amount of passion and devotion that she's offering him. Um, and I think Suzuki is for the audience, perhaps uh, a person who allows you to really understand that and see that this is actually a tragedy unfolding in mm -hmm. front of us. And no, I don't think that she makes a mistake or a bad choice of saying, no, I'm not going to interfere. I think she understands. I, I can't personally change her. Her she's too, it, her self-determination is exactly that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not part of that. But I can stand with her. I can wait all night and stay yep. up with her, with, with the child. And I that's my place. That's what I do. I let her see yep. that I'm here. Yep. Great colleague, as are you, my friend. Thank uh, you so much. This was great a great pleasure. pleasure. And one day soon in New York, in San Francisco, in who knows where. <laughs> who knows where. <laughs> Thank you. My when pleasure. You Peter Grimes, I'll come out and see it. Well, there it is. Now it has to happen. <laughs> okay, Matthew.